Hi there! Before we get started, I just wanted to pop in and give you guys a little content warning. You see, this book deals with themes of sexual assault, and if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, these are the time codes on the screen right now that you are going to want to avoid. Ring is a 1991 horror mystery novel written by Koji Suzuki. It was translated into English in 2003 by Robert B. Romer and Glenn Wally. The story centers around a reporter named Kazuyuki Asakawa as he investigates the mysterious death of four teenagers. When he is struck by the curse that killed them, he and his friend Ryuji Takayama race against the clock to break the curse once and for all. American viewers may be more familiar with this title as the 2002 movie The Ring starring Naomi Watts, or if you're Gen Z, you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's also fine. So why am I talking about this 30-year-old book that nobody but me cares about? Well, it came out in June of 1991, so it's a 30th anniversary video special that we're doing. Now I know you might be thinking, if it's an anniversary video, why aren't you waiting until June? To which I say... If I'm being honest, this isn't the book I'm the most interested in talking about right now. I'm more interested in talking about the sequels, Spiral and Loop. But in order to get there, we need to get through this one first. Besides, there's plenty of good, heavy air quotes, good stuff in the first book that's also a lot of fun to talk about. A lot of the stuff, rightfully so in my opinion, didn't make it to the movie versions. The movies, while they still share many of the same plot beats, diverge pretty significantly from the books. Full disclosure, for the longest time I believed that they simply never adapted Spiral or Loop, and The Ring 2 and all of its sequels was just its own continuity. But I was wrong. They did adapt Spiral. It's just that Spiral was so poorly received, the studio went and made The Ring 2 and then hoped everyone would quietly forget that they ever did Spiral which I guess worked because I'd never heard about it. The Ring 2 is also a treasure, but in very different ways. The movies star different characters, which is understandable for many reasons, the first of which being that both the lead characters in this book suck and I hate them, and I assume the people writing the screenplays felt very much the same way. They do share similarities, such as the protagonist's last name still being Asakawa, Although she is now Reiko Asakawa, and her companion is her ex-husband, who is still named Ryuji Takayama, but is otherwise a completely different character from his book version. Which makes it weird when he doubles back into his book characterization for the movie version of Spiral, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're here to talk about Ring, the book. The book is separated into four parts, each of which have smaller subchapters. It feels weird to call them full chapters because a lot of them are really short. Like, three or four pages short. Like, Dan Brown short. The first part, Autumn, opens by describing a condominium complex that isn't where our point of view character is. And can I just say that I like a lot of the prose in this book? Off to the south, the oily surface of the ocean reflected on the glittering lights of the factory. A maze of pipes and conduits crawled along the factory walls like blood vessels on muscle tissue. Countless lights played over the front wall of the factory like insects that glow in the dark. Even this grotesque scene had a certain type of beauty. The factory casts a wordless shadow on the Black Sea beyond. Like, portraying the city as a living organism isn't exactly groundbreaking, but it's still a good use of simile. Granted, I'm working off of the English translation because I know precisely enough Japanese to ask where the bus is, but not enough to understand what the answer is. So I can't say for certain how much of this is present in the original and how much of this is the translators. And translation versus localization is a really interesting topic, but it's beyond the scope of this video. But of course, there are things in this book that could have easily been left out. There's actually a pretty solid example of that in this chapter. It's not like graphic, but I still don't need to know that she remained seated on the toilet, lost in thought for a long time after she had finished peeing. The violent beating of her heart had still not subsided. What was going on? She took several deep breaths to steady herself, then stood up and pulled up her shorts and panties together. Now that was nowhere near the worst thing in this book. That would be Ryuji. He's awful. We'll get to him. 
but I still feel like you could probably have cut out the part describing the teenage girl's bathroom habits and nothing of value would have been lost. The teenage girl in question is Tomoko Oishi, and she is about to have a very bad night. Tomoko is home alone and plagued not only by the heat and a test she hasn't studied for, but by an unseen presence stalking her through her own home. And honestly, this is a really solid opener. Tomoko's running commentary through the chapter reminds me strongly of my own struggles with anxiety, where my logical brain knows that everything's fine, but my traitorous body is screaming at me that no, actually, nothing is fine and I'm literally about to die. And if you were going into this book blind, like I am not, it would be a really effective way of setting up the mystery. What's going on with Tomoko? Is it all in her head, or is there really another presence in her house? While paralyzed with fear as the presence draws ever closer, Tomoko stops to vaguely complain about a thing that she had done with her friends that might have caused this, because it's still supposed to be a mystery. Suzuki very deliberately avoids giving any specifics out. I know that he has to at least introduce the idea that Tomoko had done something to bring this upon herself, but it feels really cheap to introduce it by saying it like, what if it's? She didn't want to think the rest. If she did, if she went on like that, she'd remember, and she didn't think she could stand the terror. This is something that comes up a lot in Japanese media, and I hate it every time. The characters know a thing, but they don't want to tell the audience yet, so it's always like, could it be that person? Or what if it's because of? And it's like, I don't know, probably. What are we talking about? The movie adaptations don't run into this problem at all. Both the Japanese and American versions of this movie open with two girls having, like, a sleepover or something. And the cursed girl tells her friend about the spooky cursed videotape like it's already a popular urban legend. Like Bloody Mary or Kuchisake Ona. This works largely to the movie's benefit in my opinion because it cuts out the more boring part of the story which is Autumn. The scene ends abruptly, with Tomoko turning to face her tormentor, and I hope you all liked those seven pages that we spent with Tomoko, because we will never see her again. Our perspective shifts to that of a tired and grumpy cab driver named Kimura. He is exhausted from a long day of dealing with difficult customers and is just generally a whole ass mood. Kimura is annoyed that a kid on a motorcycle pulled up next to his door while they were waiting at a red light. The kid falls off his bike and Kimura gets out of the car to check to see if the kid damaged his door when he fell over. Which is a little bit callous, but also that shit comes out of Kimura's paycheck, so I kinda get it. Anyway, the kid struggles to get his helmet off as he dies and the chapter ends. These two scenes open with timestamps so we can tell that the first two events are happening simultaneously. Chapter 2, which notably does not have a timestamp on it, is where we're finally introduced to our protagonist, Tasakawa. He is getting out of work after a long night working on a story of some kind, and he decides to take a taxi home instead of getting on the subway, and we get this gem of a line. If he had taken the subway home, however, a certain pair of incidents would almost certainly never have been connected. Of course, a story always begins with such a coincidence, and I hate it. This fourth wall breaky, do you want the story to happen or not, feels so disconnected from how the rest of the story is narrated. It feels like it belongs in a different book and ended up here by mistake. It's like that one time that I wanted to go to Walmart, but I ended up walking into the Lowe's next door by mistake and wandered around for ten full minutes trying to figure out where the home improvement section ended so I could go grab the snacks I came in for. Anyways, because Asakawa decided to take a cab instead of the subway, he ends up in Kimura's cab. And here's a thing that's actually really interesting about the curse that comes up a few times in the books but doesn't ever really make it into the movies. It's this idea that the curse compels people to do things. Even Kimura, who is about as indirectly involved in the situation as he can be, is affected by it, and is compelled to spread the knowledge of the curse in one way or another. Kimura couldn't explain why. Every time he passed this place, he felt compelled to tell people about what happened. If Kimura glanced in his rearview mirror and saw that his fare was sleeping, then he would give up. But if not, then he'd tell every passenger, without exception, everything that occurred. It was a compulsion. Every time he'd go through that intersection, he was overcome by a compulsion to talk about it. So Asakawa's journalist senses go off when Kimura tells him about the death he witnessed, and he decides that it might be worth looking into. It isn't until after they've been talking for a while that Asakawa connects the death that Kimura is talking about with that of a different person, who he doesn't reveal until a bit later, but I'm just going to spoil it now, is Tomoko, who is his niece. 
Now, in both the Japanese and American versions of the movie, our protagonist gets wrapped up in the curse business when they talk to their respective niece's friends at her wake. Asakawa, on the other hand, is never shown going to the wake of his dead niece. In fact, he only seems vaguely aware that he had a niece at all, and is completely unaffected by her death. Like I said, he kind of sucks. The chapter closes out with Asakawa wondering if he ought not to keep his nose out of this story because he is implied to have been in trouble at his job at some point in the past. They elaborate further on whatever this trouble might have been in the next chapter, but it's never directly stated what it was that he actually did. Chapter 3 opens with Asakawa having a discussion about what he found with his editor. His editor is against him getting involved in this story because of whatever it was he did to get into trouble in the past. As I said, it's never explicitly stated what he did, but they do mention that it happened two years prior to the story taking place during a sudden influx of supernatural photographs and paranormal stories being sent to newspapers all across Japan. During that time, Asakawa was writing a biography of somebody named Shoko Kageyama. I did some googling about Shoko Kageyama, but I wasn't able to turn up anything substantial. Just some social media pages for people who have that name. Granted, I don't actually know anything about this boom of occult photography, I feel like I heard something like that happened, but I haven't been able to find it very many details about it. I imagine it's a cultural reference that a Japanese reader back in 1991 would have understood that I, an American 30 years later, have no context for. Whatever it was that happened, Asakawa is stuck writing fluff pieces off where he can't cause any more trouble. His editor, Oguri, is understandably wary of Asakawa's story. As far as he can tell, two unrelated people died of heart attacks in two unrelated locations, and that's not much of a news story. On to chapter 4. Asakawa is stuck doing his actual job that he's being paid for, holding flattering interviews with CEOs and various businesses. After he finishes, he moves on to scouring other newspapers for any clues about deaths that might also be related to the two he already knows about. He manages to find a bite and tracks down the journalist who wrote the article, who happened to be a friend of his anyway. Yoshino is a pretty minor character, but he does come up from time to time and even has a point of view chapter later in the book, but I always forget he exists beyond this chapter. Anyway, Yoshino asks why Asakawa wants to know about the article he wrote, and fearing that his friend might steal the story out from under him, Asakawa lies. Unfortunately, he rolled a 1 on his deception roll, and Yoshino sees through his lie immediately. Basically, two kids had parked at a makeup point and got interrupted by a curse, which was honestly just so rude, and they ended up dying pressed up against the car doors. Having confirmed his suspicions, Asakawa thanks Yoshino and leaves, and promises to tell him the full story when he's got more details. Chapter 5 Asakawa is going over what we already know again. The four teenagers died all at the same time and they all knew each other. This chapter mostly serves as filler, and for Asakawa to float the idea that it was a novel virus that had struck the teenagers dead, which certainly does hit differently in 2021, let me tell you. Chapter 6 is about Asakawa and his family visiting Tomoko's parents. And by family, I mean his wife, Shizu, who has only been mentioned in passing and never by name, and his daughter, Yoko, who hasn't come up at all until now. This is the chapter where I really begin to turn against Asakawa. There are a few reasons, but I guess I'll start with the one that is relatively minor. Asakawa is a terrible husband and father. There are a few examples of him just being terrible to and about his family. She'd flail her little arms and legs, wail at the top of her lungs, and just generally make life difficult for her parents. At times like this, Asakawa became intensely conscious of the looks of the people around him and he'd start sulking to himself, as though he were the prime victim of his daughter's shrieking. I'll go put her down, he said, caressing his daughter's cheek with the back of his hand. The words sounded so strange coming from Asakawa, who hardly ever helped with the baby. And my personal favorite, what's gotten into you today? You're acting weird, said Shizu, without interrupting her dishwashing. You put Yoko down, you're helping in the kitchen, are you turning over a new leaf? If so, I hope it sticks. Asakawa was lost in thought, and didn't want to be bothered. He wished his wife would act like her name, which meant quiet. The best way to seal a woman's mouth was to not reply. Oh, by the way, did you put a disposable on her before putting her to bed? 
We wouldn't want her to leak at somebody else's house. Asakawa showed no interest, but just looked around at the kitchen walls. This guy sucks. Why did Shizu marry him? Girl, you could have done so much better. The second, which I think is probably the worst thing, is how he's using the trip to visit Tomoko's parents as a cover to snoop through her room for the sake of his new story. In the movie versions, the reason the protagonist got involved at all was because the dead girl's mother asked her to investigate. In this version, not only do the parents not ask Asakawa for his help, they don't even know that there might be something bigger at play at all. All they know is their daughter suddenly and tragically passed away from a heart attack. I'm not sure there is a good way to approach two grieving parents who just lost their only child and tell them that you are looking into their daughter's death in connection with three others for the sake of a news story, because it actually sounds pretty shitty and callous when you put it that way. And remember, he isn't in this to try and help his Tomoko's parents find closure, or even because he himself cared about his niece and wants closure for himself. The only things he really knew about Tomoko was that she was a teenage girl and shampooed her hair. Even when he found out about the second set of victims, Asakawa heard the name of the school the girl went to and didn't go, Aha! The same school as Tomoko. Asakawa is looking into this purely because he thinks it's an interesting story to put in the newspaper. So he decides to use putting his daughter down for a nap as a cover to sneak into Tomoko's room and snoop around. The entire time he's going through her desk drawers and the pockets of her clothes, he's going like, Oh, it's not like I'm doing this to write an article about it. Which, yes, you are. Remember? That was why you went to ask your editor to let you look into this three chapters ago? Did, did you forget why you came here? His efforts are rewarded when he finds a membership card to a resort. He hears somebody on the stairs and manages to get out just in the nick of time. He convinces Tomoko's mother that he is simply lost and looking for the bathroom, managing to avoid any consequences for his actions. That was a close one. Asakawa decides to pocket the card and goes out to buy a pack of cigarettes, and also use a payphone to call the number on the card. For the young people in the audience, before cell phones, we had these things called payphones, which were usually posted up outside of convenience stores or shopping malls or what have you, where you would put quarters in and be able to make phone calls. Anyway, Asakawa calls the number and pretends to be a potential customer, asking about locations and rates. He manages to find the resort that the team seemed most likely to have visited. When he finishes his phone call and returns, he ignores his wife, then begins to act out Tomoko's final moments. The baby wakes up crying before his wife can ask too many questions. It turns out the baby was crying because she saw a Hanya mask, one of these guys, hanging on the wall, and it spooked her. Asakawa decides that they should probably go home now that he's mined the dead child's room for all of the clues that he thinks he's going to get out of it. Once they get home, Asakawa tracks down the boy who the membership card belongs to and confirms that the group did stay at the resort sometime in late August, although he isn't able to come up with an exact date right away. He also asks Shizu if she has been teaching Yoko about demons, because apparently the only reason a literal baby would be afraid of a scary looking mask is if she understood that the mask was meant to represent a demon and that demons are something to be scared of. Because by his logic, Godzilla looks scary, but Yoko isn't afraid of Godzilla. And I'm not- and I'm not so sure that's a sound conclusion. That's the end of part one. I honestly remember Autumn covering Asakawa getting to the cabin and watching the video, but apparently I was incorrect on that front. Part two is called Highlands. Because it's a new part, the chapters have been set back to one, so chapter one begins with Asakawa driving through the rain to visit the cabin where the kids stayed before they died. He, in a flashback, discovered the date that the group had stayed in the cabin exactly one week before their deaths and which cabin they stayed in. Asakawa then called in a reservation for that same cabin. While he is driving up the mountain, Asakawa threatens us with things to come. Namely, he thinks about who he wishes he could bring along to help him investigate. He was just the guy. But he was idiosyncratic. Asakawa wasn't sure how long he could take his personality. Yeah, dude. Me either. Let me enjoy these beautiful non ryuji parts of the book in peace. Anyway, Asakawa makes it to the resort, checks in, and notices a bunch of VHS tapes for rent. Again, for those of you in the audience who aren't old enough to have used these regularly, VHS tapes are what we used to use back before DVDs became a thing. They were these little plastic rectangles with film inside that you could put in a box that was attached to the TV to watch movies on. You also used to be able to record TV shows onto them. 
So Asakawa heads into the cabin that I remind you he believes is invested with some sort of heretofore unknown infectious disease that causes heart attacks, armed with nothing more than a pair of gloves and his wits. He also reveals himself to be a man of culture. The only thing Asakawa needed to use, though, was a kettle to boil water for his cup o noodles. Asakawa goes through the cabin, turning on all the lights and searching for any clues that might still be in the cabin several weeks after the group of kids stayed there. When he comes up with nothing obvious, he decides to stop and have some whiskey, which I don't think is the best thing to be drinking when working on an investigation, but I didn't go to reporter school, so what do I know? Asakawa filled a glass with ice from the freezer and poured it half full of the whiskey he had bought. He was about to top it off with tap water, but then he hesitated. Turning off the tap, he persuaded himself that he'd really rather have it straight on the rocks. He didn't have the courage to put anything from this room into his mouth. He'd been careless enough to use ice cubes from the freezer, but he was under the impression that microorganisms didn't like extreme heat or cold. I actually really like this section. The narration is said that Asakawa doesn't really believe that it was a virus that killed those kids, but he's just telling himself that because the alternative is believing that their deaths were supernatural in nature, which would be a silly thing for a rational person to think. So he's taking these half-hearted precautions against the virus, even though he himself knows that his reasoning is flimsy at best. Again, this sure does hit different in 2021. While he's searching around, Asakawa discovers the guest book for the cabin, and it's there that we find the compulsion part of the curse strike again. Asakawa kept turning pages. He could feel some sort of force urging him to open the pages at the end of the book, but he kept going through them in order. He was afraid that if he messed up the chronology, he might miss something. The compulsion part of the curse is the part that I find the most interesting. This isn't like a Juon situation where it's just an angry ghost lashing out at every living thing that's unfortunate enough to cross its path. The curse in this book has a purpose that it's working toward, and it pushes people into doing things that are advantageous to that goal. We don't know what the goal is yet, but it's pretty clear at this point that it does have one. And to be honest, I think that's scarier than just an angry ghost that kills anything that moves. Asakawa finally finds the entry that slept by the four teens. It has a cryptic warning about not watching it unless you've got the guts. Asakawa deduces that they likely mean some sort of videotape and goes out to see if he can figure out which one. He spots the spookiest looking one, a blank tape that not even the manager knows how it got there and decides to rent it. Chapter 2 Asakawa finally, 75 pages in, watches the videotape. It is kind of strange to be reading a written description of what is happening in a movie. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it is like four pages long, but here are some highlights. These were poorly written, as if scrawled by a white brush on jet black paper. Somehow though, he managed to make out what they said. Watch until the end. A command. These words disappeared and the next floated into view. You will be eaten by the lost. In the next scene, people appeared for the first time. An old woman, face lined with wrinkles, sat perched on a pair of tatami mats on a wooden floor. Her hands rested on her knees and her left shoulder was thrust slightly forward. She was speaking, slowly, looking straight ahead. Her eyes were different sizes. When she blinked, it looked like she was winking instead. She was speaking in an unfamiliar dialect and he could only catch every other word or so. The face of a newborn baby filled the screen. From somewhere, he could hear a baby's first cry. This time, too, he was sure it didn't come from the television speakers. It came from very near, beneath his face. It was very like a real voice. On screen, he could now see hands holding the baby. The left hand was under the baby's head, and the right was behind its back, holding it carefully. They were beautiful hands. Totally absorbed by the image, Asakawa found himself holding his own hands in the same position. Startled, he pulled back his hands. He had felt something. Something warm and wet, like amniotic fluid or blood in the weight of flesh. The voices were clearly not welcoming or cheering. Finally, he made out a word. Liar. And another. Fraud. By now, there were perhaps a thousand faces. They had become nothing but black particles, filling the screen until it looked like the television had been turned off. But the voices continued. It was more than Asakawa could bear. All that criticism directed right at him. Then the face of a man appeared. Unlike the previous images, this man was definitely alive. He had a pulsing vitality. 
As he watched, Asakawa began to feel hatred towards him. He had no idea why he should hate this man. He wasn't particularly ugly. His forehead sloped a bit, but other than that, he was actually rather well formed. But there was something dangerous in his eyes. They were the eyes of a beast closing in on its prey. The writing in the first scene had been crude, like that of a child just learning to write. But this was somewhat better. White letters drifting into view and then fading read, Those who have viewed these images are fated to die at this exact hour one week from now. If you don't wish to die, you must follow these instructions exactly. Asakawa gulped and stared wide-eyed at the television. But then the scene changed yet again. A complete and utter change. A commercial came on. A perfectly ordinary, common television commercial. This part definitely works better in film, although both movie versions change the actual contents of the video substantially. The Japanese version does have some text in it, but again, I can't read Japanese, so I don't know if it says that bit about being eaten by the lost. It definitely didn't have the ending text, which is the part that I find the most charming about this whole video. The spooky ghost girl who cursed the videotape just tacked on the kind of threat that you would find in a chain email that your grandma forwarded to you. There's this visual novel you can get on Steam called The Letter that was very clearly inspired by Ring or maybe The Ring. Anyway, it had a similar curse mechanic where characters read a cursed letter and it has this chain email ending like forward this to 10 people or die horribly. And I thought it was so silly because I didn't realize at the time that Ring, the OG, did it too. <laughs> it is just delightful. And here's something that I actually forgot was in this book. At that moment, the phone rang. Asakawa's heart nearly jumped out of his chest at the sound. He picked up the receiver. He felt as though something were concealing itself, watching him from the darkness. Hello? He managed to croak. There was no reply. Something was swirling around in a dark, cramped place. There was a deep rumble, as if the earth were resounding in the damp smell of earth. The phone call was in the book. To be honest, I forgot that it was in here at all. I kind of assumed that the phone call was an invention of the movies to sub in for that, you know, cheesy chainmail ending of the video. But apparently it's been here all along. I just forgot about it. So after hanging up the phone, Asakawa decides that he's entirely too freaked out by the whole situation to stay in the cabin overnight. He grabs the tape, packs his things, and gets out of there. And that's the end of part two. Also, the end of the good part of the book. In part three, Gusts, we are finally introduced to the character that Suzuki has been threatening us with, Ryuji. Now, I've been pretty subtle about it up until this point, so you might not have noticed. But I fucking hate Ryuji. When I was going through this book for the review and making notes, I used these color-coded tabs. Yellow tabs were for things that I hated. Ryuji is introduced on page 88. By page 123, I had run out of yellow tabs. He is, without a doubt, the absolute worst thing about this book. Asakawa sucks, don't get me wrong. But I didn't start to loathe him until fucking Ryuji comes along. Remember how in the first two parts Asakawa was relatively competent and was, like, able to carry on an investigation on his own? I'll say goodbye to that. Asakawa is now useless. This is the Ryuji show now. Also, also, do you remember at the very beginning when I had that little content warning? Well, I cannot proceed without talking about this, so well, I'm going to go ahead and flush those time codes again so that you can skip ahead if discussion of sexual assault upsets you. Ryuji is a fucking rapist. In the first chapter we meet him, he informs Asakawa that he, quote, did another one, and Asakawa goes, that's three that I know about, and then... Suzuki goes into this flashback scene where Ryuji approaches Asakawa before school like, Hey, can you keep a secret? I did a rape last night. And Asakawa is like, oh, okay. And they become friends, which super doesn't reflect well on Asakawa, by the way. In the next chapter, Ryuji relives the first rape for us. And no, I'm not going to read it out for you, but suffice to say that it is awful and I hate these two characters more every minute. And the reason Asakawa decides to show Ryuji the tape, it's not because, like, he's a rapist and, like, who even cares if he gets eaten by the lost or whatever. It's because, quote, someone who says he wants to watch the extinction of mankind doesn't deserve to live a long life. As if he thinks that the worst thing about Ryuji is 
that he's an edgy nihilist and not the fact that he's a self-admitted rapist. And way, way later in the book, Suzuki tries to walk back on this and imply that all of the rapes Ryuji brags about were actually lies and Ryuji is a virgin, actually. This is told to us by Ryuji's student, who is also his girlfriend, and she knows this because of women's intuition. On another note, Ryuji just generally sucks, in other ways. Asakawa did an interview for him for a piece he was working on, and he was asked what his dreams for the future were, he responded like, I want to be there when humanity is wiped out, Ryuji had said, sweat gleaming on his overheated face. All those idiots who prattle on about world peace and the survival of humanity make me want to puke. While viewing the extinction of the human race from the top of a hill, I would dig a hole in the earth and ejaculate into it over and over. Our hero, everybody. I'm actually really torn because I don't know how Suzuki expects people to react to Ryuji. On one hand, he says that everybody around him, even Asakawa, dislikes him on an almost instinctual level. He says and does reprehensible things, so it seems like you're not supposed to like him. But on the other hand, He's the most amazing super mega genius to ever genius, and everything he says is always correct, and it only gets worse as the books go on. So remember how I said before that Asakawa is basically useless from here on out? I wasn't joking. Everything that gets discovered or puzzled out is done by Ryuji. Asakawa is just there to stand by him and occasionally cry about how he's going to die soon. And also, this is incredibly minor, but I will never get over it. Ryuji uses words like wifey and babykins, and I just can't stand grown adults who use words like that. I know, like, cringe culture is out or whatever, but it makes me cringe out of my skin. Like, you're an adult with a mortgage, Sandra. You don't have a hubby. You have a husband. You pay taxes. And I can't even blame Suzuki for that entirely. I don't know what sort of horrible baby talk Ryuji used in the original Japanese. But this was a conscious choice from our translators. Robert. Glynn. I don't know which one of you two is responsible for this, but you should be ashamed of yourselves. Anyway, that was more or less the first chapter of part three. Chapter 2. Ryuji and Asakawa head to Asakawa's place. Shizu hates Ryuji and specifically asks Asakawa to not bring him around because he gives her a bad feeling. Asakawa ignores her and brings Ryuji over anyway, figuring it should be fine since she's usually asleep by 9 anyway. Ryuji asks Asakawa to make him a copy of the tape so that he can watch it at home as well. Asakawa is like, sure, and puts on the video for Ryuji to watch, plays two chicken shit to watch it a second time, and goes out to smoke a cigarette instead. While he's out there at the narration saw, he promised his wife when Yoku was born that he wouldn't smoke inside the apartment. He'd never broken that promise. Although they'd been married for a full three years, he and his wife had a relatively good relationship. He couldn't go against his wife's wishes, not after she'd given him his darling Yoko. Which, what are you talking about, narrator? First of all, he is explicitly going against his wife's wishes right now, in this very scene. Second of all, where was all this loving husband and father energy back when he was using the visit to his grieving sister-in-law's home as a cover to snoop through their dead kid's room? You've already made it explicitly clear that Asakawa makes no effort to parent or even help with his darling Yoko, and will straight up ignore his wife if she dares to speak to him until she shuts up and leaves him alone. I skipped over it, but literally one page ago there was this anecdote about how Shizu used to leave Asakawa notes asking him to wake her up if she was asleep when he got home, and he had too much trouble trying to get her to wake up, so he just kind of stopped doing it until she gave up and stopped leaving him notes. So while Ryuji is watching the tape, Shizu wakes up, and Asakawa rushes to turn it off so that his wife doesn't get accidentally cursed, which I guess that's close to being a decent husband. But what probably would have been better is not doing this in your home where your wife or child could accidentally see the cursed videotape that you know for certain kills people. Like, why are you keeping that in the house, my guy? And Ryuji is like, maybe we should let her watch it with us. Nasakawa gets so mad he punches a table and Shizu is like, 
Whatever, I didn't want to watch porn with you two anyway and goes back to sleep. Ryuji finishes watching the video and they discuss whether or not the kids are really the ones who taped over the instructions at the end. I'm not really sure why this is what they're getting hung up on. They do believe that the curse is real and that they are going to die in one week's time regardless of who taped over it. The important thing is that it was taped over, not who did it. But for some reason these guys were like, no, we absolutely have to confirm that these four teens taped over this video because... reasons. I guess their reasoning is that if someone who wasn't the teens taped over it, they might still be alive and know what the end of the video said. But according to the guy who gave the tape to Asakawa, the tape had been gathering dust on his shelf for at least a month. He didn't even seem to realize that he had it until Asakawa pointed it out to him. So even if someone had watched it and erased the ending between the teens watching it and the tape finding its way onto the rental shelf, that person would be long dead. Like I said, it's a weird thing to get hung up on and it seems like a waste of their increasingly limited time, but they're determined, I guess. They managed to find the show that the teens have used to tape over the ending of the cursed tape, and they decide that if they can confirm that the show was airing when the kids were in the cabin, that would prove that the kids were the ones who taped over it. This is, of course, all Ryuji's idea. In fact, Ryuji just kind of delegates all of the fact-checking to Asakawa, while Ryuji decides to try and analyze the tape in order to figure out who made it and why. He suggests that Asakawa enlist Yoshino's help, you remember that reporter friend from back in part one, and he even goes so far as to suggest that Asakawa trick the poor man into watching the videotape in order to convince him to help. Chapter 3 opens with Asakawa heading into work to explain the situation to his editor. Since, for obvious reasons, he doesn't want to waste time interviewing businessmen while he could be researching a way to not die of a curse. And Aguri is like, that sounds fake. But Asakawa is like, I have the videotape in my hands right now. Watch it if you don't believe me. Which is kind of a messed up thing to say to someone, in my opinion. And Aguri is like, I still don't believe you, but I'm good on the creepy video front, thank you. But internally, Aguri is like, I absolutely don't believe him, but if that videotape really is cursed, too spooky. So Asakawa gets the week off to try and figure out how to not die, provided he promises to write an article about his findings. Asakawa goes off to research the mountain that was featured in the video like Ryuji asked. I probably should have mentioned the mountain. There was a volcanic explosion in the tape, I skipped over it. There was like four pages of text and this video is already really long and I had to cut something somewhere and he decides that it was probably Mount Mihara and moves on to calling all of the guests who stayed in the cabin before the teens did in the hopes of figuring out when the videotape was recorded. Asakawa is operating under the assumption that the tape was a recording of an airwaves hijacking like the one that happened in Chicago in 1987. Although in the book, Asakawa cites an incident that happened to NHK last year. Since the book takes place in 1990, that would mean it happened sometime in 1989. But like with Shoko Kageyama, I haven't been able to find a real-life incident that it might be referring to even after minutes of googling. Anyway, while calling the families who stayed in the cabin, Asakawa manages to contact the family that actually did bring along a tape because they wanted to record a TV show. Look, I'm very sorry, but could you please check to see if you have an empty case lying around? Huh? She asked vacantly. Even if she understood his question, she couldn't guess what he was getting at, and it made her slow on the uptake. Please, somebody's life may depend on it. Housewives were susceptible to the matter of life and death ploy. Oh, you mean like having basic human empathy? This is another thing that bothers me about these two characters, the utter contempt they have for the people around them. Obviously, it's good to give your characters flaws. It causes conflict and drives the story forward. That's how stories work. I know this. But ideally, you do want to give the audience at least one reason for your readers to hope that the protagonist succeeds. I don't hope Asakawa succeeds. He sucks, and Ryuji sucks worse. And frankly, by this point in the book, I am rooting for the curse. Let's go evil videotape. Chapter 4 opens with Asakawa going home. He decides to drink a bunch because he can't sleep without alcohol, which I guess is kind of understandable. 
I only have regular things to be anxious about, and I have trouble going to sleep if I don't take melatonin. Anyway, he finds a note letting him know that Ryuji called and decides to call him back. Assuming it was Ryuji who answered the phone, Asakawa just kind of swears at him and is shocked and embarrassed when he realizes that a woman answered the phone instead. Asakawa immediately assumes that this woman is Ryuji's lover, his word, and she tells him that she'll let Ryuji know that he called when he gets back. So Asakawa goes to bed and spends paragraphs wondering what Shizu and Yoko are going to do when he dies, because for some reason he's basically resigned himself to dying at this point. I guess he's just in it for the article at this point. He's all, at least the condo is paid off so I have something to leave them. Better make sure my life insurance is up to date. And that's good and like the practical responsible thing to be doing. But he's also engaging in a whole lot of, when I die, Shizu will probably move back in with her parents and have to go back to work. I'm sure she'll have a new husband within three years kind of stuff. The next morning, Asakawa wakes up and calls Ryuji, like, where the fuck were you? And Ryuji is like, I was out drinking. And Asakawa gets annoyed, even though he was also drinking the previous night, if you'll recall. So Asakawa decides to head to Ryuji's place and they go over everything Asakawa learned in the last chapter. That's another thing that kind of annoys me about this book. There's a lot of going over the thing we learned last chapter. Like, Suzuki doesn't seem to trust his audience to remember little details, like the key plot element we just discovered three pages ago. Asakawa admits that he hasn't been able to find even a rumor about an airwave hijacking that took place on the day that the boy who recorded the tape stayed in the cabin, and Ryuji points out that the channels in the cabin would be different from the ones in Tokyo. So the kid recorded something that was airing on the channel that nobody in the region ever used, making it more likely for an airwave hijacking to go unnoticed by the people living in the area. They also briefly discussed the AIDS crisis and Kawasaki disease and how people didn't immediately know what was causing the deaths at the start of the crisis, and it is possible that there are more cases that they haven't been able to connect to the four dead teenagers. Ryuji confirms that the mountain that appeared in the video was indeed Mount Mihara because the old woman in the video was speaking a regional dialect that comes from that same area. Ryuji also had his professor friend decipher the full transcript of what the woman in the video was saying. How has your health been since then? If you spend all your time playing in the water, monsters are bound to get you. Understand? Be careful of strangers. Next year you're going to give birth to a child. You listen to Granny now, because you're just a girl. There's no need to worry about local people. Ryuji never says how his linguist friend managed to listen through the whole thing and translate it for him, which seems like a weird loose end, since we've seen from the cab driver in the very beginning even being a few degrees removed from the curse is enough to affect you in some way. Did Ryuji just show this guy the tape and leave him to die? Presumably, given how often he suggests doing that. Or maybe he didn't. Maybe he just made an audio recording of that section of the tape or wrote out what she said phonetically. I don't think we're expected to think that deeply about it, because his linguist friend is, to my recollection, never mentioned again. So I guess he's fine. Or dead. One of the two. Anyway, this chapter brings forth another thing about Asakawa that I find to be extremely grating. So I understand that having four days left to live is probably extremely stressful, and taking a moment to stop and complain about how unfair and terrifying it must be is a very human reaction, but for some reason, when Asakawa does it, it comes off as super whiny, and I just want him to stop complaining and get on with the plot already. Suddenly, misgivings began to well up in Asakawa's heart. Ryuji could abuse his extra day, if... For example, he came up with two guesses as to the nature of the charm. He could tell Asakawa about one, and wait for Asakawa's survival or death to tell him which one was right. That single day could turn into a powerful weapon. It doesn't really matter to you if I live or die, does it, Ryuji? Sitting there calmly like that, laughing, Asakawa wailed knowing as he did that he was becoming shamefully hysterical. You're talking like a woman now. If you've got time to bitch and whine like that, you ought to use your head a little bit more. Tragically, the worst person I know just made a good point. Could have done it without the casual sexism, but I guess we'll take what we can get out of this guy. Anyway, expect this exact conversation to repeat several times throughout the rest of the book. It's exactly as tiresome as it sounds. So Mai shows up. 
Maya's Ryuji student, who seems to also be his girlfriend. The narration wastes no time in letting us know how beautiful and graceful and perfect Maya is. She has maybe six spoken lines in this book, and most of them are about her doing things for or talking about Ryuji. Maya is not a character in her own right so much as a pretty object that happened to attach herself to Ryuji, and Asakawa is remarkably shitty about that as well. From this exchange, Asakawa couldn't help but guess the nature of their relationship. It was obvious that they were more than just teacher and student, but lovers as well. He felt the kind of annoyance that he sometimes felt when he saw a badly mismatched couple, but this went far beyond that. He was like a chameleon, changing his expression, even his speech patterns. For an instant, Asakawa was mad enough to want to open Mai's eyes by exposing Ryuji's crimes. That's... that's why you? You know what? We're just gonna walk right by that one. Ryuji chases Mai out so they can watch the video again to try and discover more clues about who filmed it and where in the hopes that they can find this person and ask them how to break the curse. Asakawa is surprised that Ryuji didn't just show Mai the tape and Ryuji is like, who do you think I am? Like, you're the one who's been all for showing everyone the tape all of the time, Ryuji. But even though literally one page ago, Asakawa is so overwhelmed by the mountain of things he needs to do in the next four days he has left to live, he threw a temper tantrum at the guy who's trying to help him. He is now too distracted by how hot Mai is to focus. There was a mountain of things that had to be done, but now Asakawa felt distracted, his thoughts somewhere else. He couldn't get her face, her body, out of his mind. Yes, he chased Mai's image from his mind momentarily, and recalled the vision of the newborn covered in slippery amniotic fluid, but the transition didn't go well. He ended up imagining Mai wet and naked. Asakawa, dude, focus. The scene ends when Ryuji makes a discovery about the tape but doesn't tell the audience what it is. Asakawa heads home to his wife. Shizu mentions that a realtor called while he was out to ask if they were interested in selling their condo, and she told him that th she would need to talk it over with her husband first, and Asakawa is all. That's how it always went. My husband is not at home, she'd say, or I'd have to talk it over with my husband first. Shizu never decided anything on her own. I'm sorry, would you rather she unilaterally decide to sell your home without asking you first? Why are you complaining that she values your opinion in little decisions like where you're going to be living? Anyway, the point of this scene is for Shizu to mention that she wants to have another baby and for Asakawa to be all angsty about how he might not be able to give her the house in the suburbs and the more children that she wants. Once Shizu goes to bed, Asakawa discovers that the tape had been moved while he was out. He wakes Shizu up and questions her about it and discovers that she and Yoko watched the whole video and are now also cursed. Finally! Two potential victims who I don't want to die. Now I finally have a reason to root for Asakawa, and to some extent, Ryuji. Chapter 5. It's the next day and Asakawa is like, let's not talk about this, okay? I don't have any answers for you, just let me handle it. And Chizu is basically like, yeah, okay, I didn't want to be an active participant in this story anyway, and goes back to watching her soaps before quietly disappearing from the story forever. Asakawa gets ready to go back to the cabin to try and find out where the signal was broadcast from, but Ryuji calls him up like, hey, come over, I got something to show you, and Asakawa bitches because it was Ryuji who told him to go back to the cabin in the first place, but he decides to just go along with it. So Asakawa goes over to Ryuji's place and cries because now his wife and kid are also going to die, and the narration takes the time to say, Asakawa could cry in front of Ryuji. Ryuji was the outlet for all the emotions he couldn't break down and show his wife. Which, I don't really know what to do with that, I just thought it was worth bringing up. Back to the video, Ryuji has split the scenes up into two categories, real and abstract. The real scenes are the ones that a real human being saw with their real human eyes, and the way he comes to that conclusion is he noticed small flashes where it fades to black as if the camera were blinking. He has also guessed that the person who filmed the video was a woman based on the frequency of the blinks. Except for all of this takes Ryuji a really long time to say, and even Asakawa complains about it. Ryuji, this is getting annoying. Hurry up and tell me what you're driving at. What does this mean? Now, now, hold your courses. Sometimes when one is given the answers up front, it dulls one's intuition. My intuition has already led me to a conclusion, and now that I have it in mind, I'll twist any phenomenon to rationalize holding on to that conclusion. It's like that in criminal investigations too, isn't it? 
Once you get the notion that he's the guy, it suddenly seems like all the evidence agrees with you. And that's not a terrible point, but man, this bitch is tiresome. So they decide to go to this research institute that collects information about paranormal phenomena. Specifically, they're collecting psychic photographs, which is where a person with psychic powers can use their brains to make an image appear on undeveloped film. So they spend the rest of the day going through the researcher's files trying to find the one that had been submitted by the person who made the video. And Asakawa bitches about having to share a hotel room with Ryuji, which is understandable, but also could you please stop whining for five whole minutes, Asakawa? Eventually, they find one that was submitted by Sadako Yamamura, and it's the same image as one that appears on the cursed tape, so they're like, hell yeah, this is her. And it may seem like I'm rushing through the second half of this book, and that's partially because I am. I'm like 10,000 words in here, and I'm still only about halfway through this book. But mostly it's because there is a lot of talking to people about things that happened. And going to lunch and talking to Ryuji about things he thinks. And sitting in an inn and reviewing the things that they talked about last chapter. Or reading a fax, which is just a long distance form of talking. And then going to talk to more people. All with Asakawa throwing a tantrum sprinkled in liberally for flavor, followed by more talking. There's not going to be a lot more of Asakawa speaking into a dead kid's room and escaping before that kid's grieving mother notices him snooping around from here on out. So let's get to that talking. Chapter 6. They decide to head to Oshima Island, where Sadako lived, in the hopes that they can track down her family, or maybe even her. Although Ryuji keeps implying that he believes that she's dead at this point, Asakawa takes a moment to go over what we learned in the last chapter because Suzuki thinks we fell asleep. Asakawa and Ryuji talk about whether or not ghosts are real, and Ryuji is like, Look, it's easier to believe in the soul than it is to not believe in one. And the researcher we just visited thought that thoughts were a form of energy and also alive, and doesn't even matter anyway, we should really focus on not dying. Yuji might have had some good points, but what Asakawa really needed from him were clearer answers. So they ride a ferry to Oshima Island and it looks like it's going to storm while they're there. While they're on the boat, they discuss how odd it is that the teens didn't at least try the ritual that might have saved their lives. Because one time when Ryuji was on a trip with the track and field team, one of the other guys said he saw a ghost in the bathroom and everyone on the track team believed him. So obviously everyone believes in ghosts all of the time. And at least one of the kids would have tried the charm even if they claim not to believe in the curse in front of their friends. And Asakawa's like, oh damn, what if the way to break the curse is impossible? Or what if it's to do a murder? Can I do a murder to save myself? But then he's like, stop thinking about that. And then he does and it never comes up again. Chapter 7. Someone who works for the same paper as Asakawa shows up and is like, yeah, there's only the one Yamamura family on this island, and they just so happen to run the bed and breakfast, which I think is the most implausible coincidence in this book so far. That one kid just so happening to record empty air, and that empty air just so happening to pick up the cursed video is quite the coincidence, but it's also like ghost magic or whatever. The Yamamuras are fishermen, but they also run the only bed and breakfast on the island, and also also they're the plot critical NPCs that the protagonists just need to talk to. Feels like a step too far. The chapter ends with them pulling up to the inn and the guy giving them a lift just like Sadako probably would be in her 40s now if she was still alive, and Asakawa is like, what do you mean if she's still alive? Which, we know she's not still alive, Asakawa. Ryuji has been saying so for three chapters now. Please try to keep up. So chapter 8 opens with Yoshino complaining that Asakawa is asking him to try and find as much information as he can on Sadako. Unfortunately for him, this is set in 1990, and social media doesn't exist yet. So he has to track down people the old-fashioned way, by calling people who might have known them on the telephone, or going and speaking to them directly. This chapter is all Sadako backstory. Instead of telling us last chapter and then repeating it here, Asakawa is giving Yoshino the recap of information that he collected off-screen. Sadako's mom was having an affair with a married man who was the professor of psychology at a university. She left Sadako with her grandparents for a while, but then came back to collect her and did something to get herself famous in the news. But nobody on the island really knows what it is because it happened in the 50s and news traveled slower, but Shizuko, Sadako's mom, came home afterwards and jumped into the volcano. The following year, Sadako predicts that the volcano is going to erupt and is right, 
and everyone on the island thinks she's cool and wants her to predict more stuff, but Sadako is like, I don't have any psychic powers, please leave me alone, and leaves the island entirely the second she turns 18 and no one on the island hears anything from her ever again. So Yoshino heads to the theater troupe where Sadako worked in the city, and there's this really out of place bit where Yoshino doesn't like one of the actors because his voice is too shrill and womanly, and his arms and legs are too long. And like, just say what you want to say, Yoshino, we're all friends here. So he manages to flag down somebody who worked there when Sadako did and interviews him about her. The actor keeps calling Sadako creepy and eerie, and when Yoshino presses for more details, the actor reveals that he remembered walking into a room to find Sadako watching TV, but when she walked away, he discovered that the TV had been unplugged the whole time. So naturally, he gossips about this with other guys at the theater, and one of them talks about going to, quote, storm Sadako's apartment, and everyone else is like, he's drunk, he's not really gonna do it. And then they never find out for sure if he did, because the next day the dude staggers into rehearsals and dies of sudden heart failure on the spot. So Yoshino grabs Sadako's acting headshot and is like, what do you mean, Eerie? She's hot. Which, it's a weird thing that this book keeps doing, stopping to inform everyone that there's no need to worry. The women in this book are still attractive. Chapter 9. The typhoon has struck and stranded Asakawa and Ryuji on the island. Asakawa throws a tantrum about it, but Ryuji is like, hey dude, chill. Maybe the curse can only be broken on this island, and that's why the kids weren't able to break it, because they couldn't afford to come out to the island. And then the innkeeper is like, well, there's this old friend of Shizuko's who still lives on the island, why don't you go talk to him? So they do, and this part doesn't really have anything to do with anything, if I'm being honest. They cut it out in the movies, and for good reason. It doesn't really add anything. Basically, when they were teens, Shizuko asked the guy to row her out to the middle of the ocean so she could rescue this Buddhist statue that occupation soldiers had dropped into the ocean, and then Shizuko began having psychic visions. Yoshino's fax comes in, and Asakawa has this to say. Asakawa suddenly recalled my Takano. If you compared them purely on the basis of looks, Sadako was far more beautiful than Mai. And yet, the scent of a woman was much more powerful with Mai. Great. Thanks. So more backstory. Shizuku left the island for Tokyo, but ended up having to be hospitalized because of her debilitating headaches. That was where she met Ikuma, who was researching, like, hypnotism or something, but decided to change to researching psychic powers when he realized that Shizuko was clairvoyant. Then they started dating, Shizuko became pregnant and came back to have Sadako. In the 50s, Ikuma's research and Shizuko herself became really famous in the media, and she got on TV for being a real-life psychic, but a lot of people thought she was faking her ability so Ikuma was like, we'll prove it, we'll have a demonstration just out in front of everybody. So they got all the media gathered to demonstrate, and the idea was to roll some dice and keep them covered, and Shizuko would be able to tell everyone what the numbers were, but Shizuko couldn't do it, and then the whole country turned on Shizuko and Ikuma because clearly they were frauds. Ikuma divorced his wife, quit his job, and went to go stand in the waterfalls until he too became a psychic. Instead, he caught pneumonia and died. So after reading Yoshino's report, Ryuji is like, Shizuko couldn't see the numbers, but Sadako clearly did, because we saw it in the video. And Asakawa was like, but if Sadako was such a powerful psychic, why was that psychic photograph that she did so shitty? You're even dumber than you look. Her mother had gained nothing but unhappiness by letting people know about her power. Her mother probably didn't want her to make the same mistake. She probably told Sadako to hide her abilities and just lead a normal life. Sadako probably carefully restrained herself so as to produce only an average psychic photo. So they decide to go out for lunch, and Asako is like, what's with the images in the video anyway? And Ryuji's like, you know how when you die your life is supposed to flash before your eyes? And Asako is like, what? You mean Sadako is probably dead? as if this is the first time he's hearing of it. Despite Ryuji saying so, once every chapter since he realized the video is just a really fancy psychic photo. And I'm starting to think that the constant repetition of information isn't because Suzuki doesn't trust his audience, it's just that Asakawa needs to go over it every chapter or else he'll forget. Ryuji gets annoyed by Asakawa asking too many questions. Hey, try using your head for a change. You rely too much on other people. What would you do if something happened to me and you were stuck trying to figure out the charm all by yourself? That hardly seemed likely. Asakawa might die, and Ryuji might have to solve the riddle alone, but the opposite would never happen. Asakawa was sure of that, if nothing else. So they head back and Yoshino calls to inform them that he's hit a dead end and can't find any more information about what happened to Sadako after she left the theater troupe. 
and Asakawa throws another tantrum, and while he's panicking, Ryuji decides to make the plot move forward again and is like, what was the connection between Sadako and the cabin where the videotape was found? So Asakawa asks Yoshino to check out the what the cabin was before it was a resort. Chapter 10. The typhoon passes so Asakawa and Ryuji can finally leave the island. Yoshino found out that the land that the cabin is now on used to belong to a tree a sanatorium that treated patients with TB. Asakawa asks Yoshino to track down contact information from anyone who might have worked there when it was still active, and Yoshino is like, I already got you, and tells him about Dr. Nagao, who not only worked for the sanatorium, but also was kept in quarantine there when he contracted smallpox. Asakawa and Ryuji decide to go visit the doctor, and on the way discuss smallpox and how it's extinct because of vaccinations, but is it really gone? What if diseases are really Satan? Chapter 11. They get to the doctor's office and Ryuji and Asakawa recognize him as the man that appeared at the end of the video. And here's where that second time stamp comes back into effect because holy smokes there's a shocking amount of sexual assault in this book. The doctor reveals that he raped Sadako and that was why people who see him on the videotape feel hatred for him even without knowing who he is. And this is the thing that I hate the most about this book. Because whenever a man rapes a woman in this book, it is never his fault. In this case, Ryuji suggests that Sadako made him do it because she didn't want to die a virgin. Except then he walks back on that like, haha, just kidding. And the doctor is like, the smallpox made me do it. And I don't think that's how smallpox works. And if we go back to when Ryuji did his first rape, he was all the spirit of mischief possessed me or whatever the fuck. And maybe it wasn't even true. Maybe the rapes were all just lies they told for some reason. But we'll get to that. I guess I should back up a little. Okay, so Sadako went to visit her father, who was staying at the sanatorium because of the pneumonia that he caught from standing under waterfalls, and she learned that he was going to die, and while she was standing outside being sad, Dr. Nagao came by and was like, hey, you want to go for a walk with me? And she said, sure. So they did. They walked into the woods, and then the smallpox overcame him, and he had to do a rape, so he raped her. And after he finished, he realized that Sadako was intersex. Had I not been a doctor, I probably would have been shocked silly. But I knew of cases such as this from photos and medical texts. Externally, the person seems completely female, having breasts and a vagina, but usually not a uterus. And for some reason, people with this condition are all beautiful. Which I don't know why he knew to add that last part in, but okay. Ryuji takes point on the interrogation because Asakawa is slow on the uptake and doesn't realize what's happening until Ryuji gets the doctor to confess to the murder. For those of you who skipped the last bit, the important bits you need to know are that Sadako was intersex and Dr. Nagao murdered her. But it might not have been his fault because I'll kill you. As I reeled from the strength of will behind those words, I instantaneously intuited that her telepathic message was no lie. There was no room within it for even a sliver of doubt. My body accepted it as certainty. She'd do it to me if I didn't do it to her first. I think my actions were still beyond my will at this point. In other words, I didn't pick her up intending to drop her into the well, but rather, the moment I picked her up, the round black mouth of the well caught my eye and put it into my mind to do it. See? He didn't intend to murder Sadako and drop her down a well, and if he did, it was self-defense anyway, and also it wasn't his fault because he had smallpox. So Asakawa has a point to where the murder happened on a map in shock and surprise it's near where the cabin was, but before they run off to the cabin, Ryuji stops him and confirms with the doctor that he did have smallpox at the time of the murder and that he likely passed it on to Sadako before she died. This will be important later. Chapter 12. They stop by a hardware store on the way to the cabin to pick up supplies. While they're there, Asakawa uses a payphone to call his wife and child. Hey, remember them? They've only been mentioned once during one of Asakawa's tantrums since the last time I talked about them back when Shizu got herself cursed. He promises to take them out for a Sunday drive once he breaks the curse, and then he's like, but wait, what if I die first? So while they're driving up to the cabin, Asakawa's like, can you please explain to me why we're going to the cabin? Because he shut his brain off chapters ago. And Ryuji explains it to him like a child, like, we need to go to find Sadako's body, to give her a proper burial, to appease her spirit. And Asakawa's like, but wouldn't she want us to bring her murderer to justice? 
And this is where Ryuji brings up the idea that Sadako used her psychic powers to force Nagao to murder her. Not exactly. Rather, I think it's possible that Sadako herself caused those impulses in old man Nagao. In other words, maybe she killed herself, but borrowed Nagao's hands to do it. And then we have this exchange. Asakawa had hit the nail on the head, and as a result, Ryuji was at a loss for an answer. That was exactly what he was going to say. Is that really so stupid? Huh? Is it really so foolish to not want to die a virgin? Ryuji pressed his point with a desperate earnestness. If it were me. If by some chance it were me, that's how I would feel. I wouldn't want to die a virgin. And all this is laying down the groundwork for that thing I mentioned a few times about how Ryuji just lied about all those awful things he did. And there are 50 pages left in this book, why bring it up now? I have a theory, but I'll tell you about it later. Anyway, Ryuji immediately turns around like LOL, JK, and the narrative moves on. They make it to the cabin and start searching for the well. Asakawa just kind of stops searching pretty early on and has a disassociative episode where he remembers this time when he was a child. He and his friends dug a little hole to go hang out in. Ryuji comes over like, what are you doing? And Asakawa realizes that he's just been digging a hole this whole time. And Ryuji is like, you need to take five, and holds him down until he stops struggling. Asakawa is like, fine, and takes a nap, with seven hours to live, which is a mood, I'll give him that. Ryuji comes back and is like, are you seriously sleeping right now? And then he's like, come on, I figured out where the well is. And it turns out that the well was underneath the cabin all along. So they push the cover off the well, and Asakawa stops to be weird about whether or not Sadako is a real woman because she's intersex, and wow, I can't believe that Asakawa is a fucking turf. So, the plan is for one of them to stay up top and haul as much water out of the well as possible, while one of them goes down to try and find Sadako's remains. Ryuji volunteers to go down into the well first, and Asakawa's like, wow! Ryuji is so brave and impressive. Asakawa tires himself out pretty quickly, so Ryuji insists that they switch places because he has the less physically demanding task, and Asakawa is like, no, there's a dead body down there. Which would be an understandable thing to say if he didn't have literal hours left to live, and this wasn't the thing that he thinks will save his life. Ryuji reminds him that if he doesn't go into the hole, Yoko will probably die too, so eventually he does. But once he gets down there, he gets so scared that he pees himself, no, I am not joking. Eventually, Asakawa manages to collect himself enough to start digging, and... Asakawa recklessly began to dig through the earth beneath him, searching for her. The thought of her pretty face and body, trying to maintain that image, that beautiful girl's bones, covered in my piss. So he manages to dig until he finds her, and Ryuji calls down like, Hey, we passed your deadline, and you're still alive. We broke the curse. And that's how part three ends. Part four, Ripples. It's basically just an epilogue. Chapter 1 opens with Asakawa being woken by a phone call. He and Ryuji are still at the cabin and have slept past checkout time. Asakawa doesn't remember much about what happened the previous night, but he does remember Ryuji helping him out of the well and washing the mud off Sadako's remains. He tries to thank Ryuji for all of his help, but cut the crap. You're going to make me puke. Gratitude isn't worth a single yen. Well then, how about some lunch? I'm buying. Oh. Well, in that case. While they're eating, Asakawa mentions that he still has some doubts about whether or not they actually broke the curse, because the old woman predicted that Sadako would have a baby, but Sadako was intersex and also a virgin until about five seconds before she was murdered, so what could she have given birth to? Chapter 2 Asakawa heads back to the island to give Sadako's remains back to her family, and then he's immediately like, okay, bye, and leaves because he doesn't want them asking him too many questions, and that's where the chapter ends. It's not even three full pages long. Chapter 3 Ryuji is chilling at home when suddenly he's overcome with an inexplicable sense of dread. He realizes quickly that the curse has come to claim him, but doesn't understand why it came for him when it passed over Asakawa. Suddenly, Ryuji understood many things. The riddle of the charm, the old woman's prophecy, and another power hidden in the images of the tape. 
At the last moment, Ryuji realizes what Asakawa did that he didn't do, but doesn't tell us, the audience. Instead, he calls Mai on the telephone. When she answers the phone, he catches the glimpse of a face in the mirror that's not his, and he starts to scream and dies. 9.49 p.m. His wish to hear the voice of the woman he loved one last time had been cruelly shattered. Instead, all he'd done is drown her in his death cries. Now he breathed his last. Ryuji realized that he wouldn't be saved, and he remembered to wish with all of his might that he could teach that asshole Asakawa the secret of the videotape. Now, I need you all to remember this. We are in Ryuji's head when he dies, and we see and hear everything that he does in his final moments. Just keep that in the back of your mind for now. Chapter 4. Asakawa finishes writing up the report on all of the things he had seen and done over the course of his investigation and goes out for dinner. While he's there, he suddenly feels uneasy and goes home to call Ryuji. Mai answers the phone and informs him of Ryuji's death. Asakawa asks her when it happened and he realizes that the curse must have gotten him. He rushes over to Ryuji's place and asks Mai to tell him everything that she knows. Mai tells him that Ryuji called her, but all he did was scream. She rushed over and found Ryuji's body. Asakawa gets ready to leave and Mai stops him like, I think you might have the wrong idea about me and Ryuji. We never fucked. In fact, I'm pretty sure Ryuji has never fucked ever in his entire life. Asakawa is like, she doesn't know the truth of what he did in junior high, but who am I to tell her? Better to let her live with the memory of the man she thought he was. And besides, maybe she's right. I'll never know for certain. Chapter 5 Asakawa is operating under the assumption that the way to break the curse requires at least one person, which is why Ryuji called Mai, and not just because he wanted to hear his girlfriend's voice in his final moments. He spends his time drinking and throwing another tantrum when he realizes he has no idea what he did to be spared. Eventually, he just gives up and starts begging for Ryuji to come back and help him. And Ryuji does! He appears briefly as a ghost to point out a book that gives Asakawa the clues he needs to solve the puzzle. I was not kidding when I said Asakawa would not make a single discovery on his own for the rest of the book. The book in question is called Epidemics and Man, and Ryuji's ghost manages to telepathically tell Asakawa what page to turn to for him to figure it out. Asakawa had made a copy of the videotape and passed it along to Ryuji, which is what broke the curse. Why was that way I took you to break the curse? I'm glad you asked. Okay, this is my favorite part of the book. Sadako wanted to have children, because, you know, she's a woman. Of course she wanted to have children, that's what they're there for. She also had contracted smallpox at the time of her death. And smallpox... <laughs> smallpox, which was... A smallpox, which was in the process of being driven to extinction by vaccines. And smallpox was really mad about it. So Sadako's psychic powers and the ghost of smallpox combined to create the curse. Smallpox would become a cursed videotape and also Sadako's child, you know, that thing she at any point expressed wanting. The book ends with Asakawa grabbing the videotape and heading to find Shizu and Yoko. Okay, so final thoughts. I'm really glad that I watched the movies first because I don't think I would have finished the book if I hadn't. This is the rare case where the movies are just a lot better than the books. They cut out a lot of the needless fluff, like the bit about the statue, which aside from being a parallel to Sadako being pulled from the well didn't really serve any purpose. Shizuko could have easily just been born with her psychic powers and nothing in the story would have changed. The characters in the movie are generally more likable. I found Ryuji in particular to be completely insufferable, and Asakawa wasn't a lot better. In fact, he is arguably worse for the company and secrets he keeps. And there's so much weird shit in here. Not like the funny weird shit, like the bit about the ghost of smallpox cursing a videotape. I mean creepy weird shit. Like how the narrative stops to fixate on how attractive all of the women the men in the story come into contact with are or the weird turfery at the 11th hour, and how every time a man does anything wrong, the narrative bends over backwards to try and absolve him of his crimes. Speaking of which, I did tell you that I would explain my theory on why 
at the very last minute, Suzuki suddenly walks back on Ryuji being the literal worst. Now, I can't prove anything, and I could be wrong, but I don't know if Suzuki went into the story knowing he was going to kill Ryuji off. I think that maybe it was either a last minute decision, and when Suzuki realized that he needed to kill Ryuji off, he was like, but wait. I crafted one of the least likable characters that I could. Nobody will be emotionally affected when he dies. So he quickly papered over it by having Mai be like, Yeah, he was just playing the scoundrel with you. I'm pretty sure he was an innocent, virginal young boy at heart. And Asakawa being like, Well, I guess you never know a guy and accepting that is the truth. Or maybe it was like an early Bakugo situation where he realized they went too far with the characterization in Ryuji's early chapters, but for some reason he couldn't just go back and edit it? Who's to say? The important thing, and the thing I need you all to keep in mind here, is that at this point the narrative is still firmly on the rails. Ghost of Smallpox? Sure, that's a little weird and extremely funny, but we've all seen the Ghost of Smallpox curse of videotape. The next book is where things are going to get weird. Okay guys, this is the part where I've got to put my call to action. So like, if you liked the video, hit the like button and maybe subscribe, I don't know, and, huh, oh, if there's another book you guys want me to do, put it in the comments, and maybe I'll do it.